Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably upon thy whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of thy perpetual providence, carry out the work of man's salvation, that things which were cast down may be raised up, and that all things may return into unity through him by whom all things were made, even thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. We are in a continuing study of John's Gospel, so if you have your Bibles, and again, I'm going to keep saying it until you keep doing it, um, I want to encourage you to go ahead and bring your Bibles with you. Those of you who did, there's a $50 bill as you leave this morning, so... Over there in confirmation class, if you bring your Bible, you get a $2 bill every week. And listen, over the weeks, that really adds up, so I'm just, you know, I'm not giving you a $2 bill, but there are stars in your crown if you bring your Bibles to Rector's Forum. Well, we are in John chapter 1, and we are taking a look at verse 14. We started to take a look at this very important verse last week, and I want to come back to it because we really didn't exhaust everything that's being said there. So if you have your Bibles, let's just go ahead and read through verses 1 through 14 so we can put everything in its proper context. These are extraordinary verses, and really 14, verse 14, is the climax of everything that the evangelist has said up to this point. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when we first started taking a look at these verses last week, we said that something is lost in the translation. John 1.14 says, he came and dwelt among us. That word by whom all things were made came and dwelt among us. But we said that in the original Greek, it literally should be translated, he came and he pitched his tent in our midst. Now the reason it's translated this way in English is because that notion of pitching his tent in our midst doesn't mean a great deal to us. But we said to the original Jewish audience, it would have meant a great deal, because this would have immediately conjured up images of the Old Testament tabernacle. I pointed out that during wanderings in the wilderness for 40 years, that the Jews didn't have a proper place to worship. It wouldn't be until the time of King Solomon that the first temple would be built. You know that temple would be destroyed, and the second temple would be constructed by King Herod, which was the temple that existed at the time of Jesus. That's what we call Second Temple Judaism. But during their wanderings in the wilderness, and for a great part of their history, the Jews had no permanent place to worship. They had a mobile worship site. It was a tent. It was sometimes referred to as the tent of meeting. It was the tabernacle, and it had great significance for them. We talked a little bit about the significance of the tabernacle in the life of the Jewish people. We said it was the center of their communal life. They would be wandering. They were a nomadic people. And when they came to stop or to make camp for however long that might be, they were very much like the Plains Indians during the um, 19th century. They wandered from place to place. But when they found a place where they would set up camp, 
the first building that would be constructed, temporary building site, would be this tabernacle. Uh, it was made of wood covered in linen sheets, and it was the center, always the center of the camp. All the various tribes, the 12 tribes, as, and, as well as the, the priests, the Levites, would always camp round about the tabernacle. So we said this is great significance for us because when Jesus is described as the tabernacle or is compared to the tabernacle, what we're saying is that Jesus is the center of our communal life as Christians. We said the tabernacle was also the place where the law was preserved. The innermost part of the tabernacle contained the Ark of the Covenant. And within the Ark of the Covenant were copies of the Ten Commandments. The first copy had been destroyed by Moses. He'd thrown them down, symbolic of the fact that the people, when he came down off the mountain, were worshiping the golden calf. They had violated the first of those commandments and by default all the rest. But a second copy of the tablets were made and they were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, which was placed in the innermost part of the tabernacle to be preserved. And we said that Jesus, again, being compared to the tabernacle, is the one who fulfills the law of God. He fulfills it perfectly. The author of Hebrews says we have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Jesus alone did his Father's will and kept the law. He said so. He said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. All of the law, all of the promises are fulfilled in him. This, as I said, was the place of meeting. It's where God revealed himself to the people. It's where he made known his will for the people. And if you want to know what God's will is, if you want to have an encounter with God, that's where you will encounter him. Not in the tabernacle anymore, but in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. We said the tabernacle was also the place where sacrifice was made. There was a brazen altar that was part of the compound where there were sacrifices continually burning, a reminder to us of the gravity of human sin. That was what the whole Old Testament sacrificial system was all about. It reminds us that God is a God of mercy, but he is also a God of justice, and sin is a serious business to him. Now, sin may seem like a small thing to us, but we should never think that it is really a small thing when you think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, everything that he endured there, he endured on our behalf in order to atone for our transgressions. And so the tabernacle was the place where sacrifice was made, where the people could be reconciled to God. And Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for us. He is the place where the full, ultimate sacrifice is made. As we say every Sunday, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Not to be offered repeatedly over and over again as the sacrifices in the tabernacle were offered over and over again because the blood and the life of animals are not sufficient to atone for the sins of human beings. But Jesus, as the Lamb of God, makes the perfect sacrifice once and for all. Nothing else need be done. And the tabernacle was also the place where we behold God's glory. That was the case. The Shekinah glory, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, all of that near the tabernacle. Well, we find the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If you want to have an encounter with the glory, the majesty of the creator of the heavens and the earth, you can do that. It shines forth in the person of his son. So all of that, we said, was there in verse 14 when John says, and he made his dwelling, he pitched his tent in our midst, and we have beheld his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. But then he goes on to add this phrase, and we didn't look at this last week, full of grace and full of truth. And I want to return to verse 14 and do a little bit of a deep dive into those two concepts of grace and truth truth, because they are two of the most important theological concepts, not just here in the Gospel of John, certainly in the Gospel of John, and we're going to see how that is the case, but supremely in the New Testament. They are there present in the Old Testament as well, but we see them clearly here in the New Testament. Grace and truth. I'll go so far as to say this, you will never understand the Gospel You'll never understand the message of Jesus Christ. You'll never understand the thrust of Christianity unless you understand those two concepts, grace and truth. So these are very important. Now, what do we mean by grace? 
Well, you know, words change in their meaning. They just do. And so it's very important that we understand what the Bible means by grace. We have our own understandings of grace, but you know that language is an evolving thing. For example, back in the 1890s, they called those the gay 90s. In the 1990s, they called it the gay 90s. And guess what? They did not mean the same thing by that term. We recognize that the language evolved and changed, and words change in their meaning today. When Johnny comes marching home again, we'll all feel gay. That was the song in World War I and during the Civil War. We'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. When we say we'll all feel gay, that's not what people mean today by that word. The language has changed. The meaning of terms change. I think that's true when it comes to this notion of grace as well. And most people think of grace. When you think of a person that has grace, what do you think of? Most of us think of a person who carries themselves well. We think of somebody who has poise or who is calm in the midst of difficulty. When you think of a graceful person, what do you think of? Well, you think of Audrey Hepburn. Oh, that, that, that's a person of grace, don't you? You see her on the silver screen type. that's grace. Or you think of Grace Kelly, hardly anybody more aptly named. Or you think of grace under fire. That is, someone who can hold it together in the midst of great difficulty or affliction. It's important to understand that when the Bible speaks of grace, it doesn't mean anything like that. There's no understanding of that notion of grace. I think sometimes when we, the Roman Catholics pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, that's what they think of, that she was a very graceful person. That's not actually what the idea means at all. When the Bible speaks of grace, and again, this is vitally important if you want to understand what Christianity is all about. When the Bible speaks of grace, what it means is God's undeserved, unearned favor. It's receiving from God what we do not deserve. It's closely related to the concept of mercy. Now, they're not exactly the same thing, but they're closely related. Mercy is basically God's grace in action. It's God's undeserved uh, undeserved favor or attitude toward those who are pitiful. That's what mercy is. But the idea of grace is God's undeserved, unearned favor. His kindness toward those who do not deserve it. So when John says he is full of grace, it means that he is full of compassion. He is long-suffering. He is merciful toward those who do not deserve it. That's vitally important. Now, theologians sometimes refer to two different types of grace. The first is common grace grace. And it means that God shows his undeserved kindness, compassion, mercy toward every single human being in one way or another. Every single person in this room at one point or another has been a recipient of God's common grace. It's called common because it's for all people. We all share it in common. Like the book Common Prayer, it means the prayers of all the people. Well, common grace means God's kindness toward all of us. Examples of common grace would be good health. If you enjoy good health today, that is an act of God's grace. It's not something that you deserve. It's not something that you've earned. God has bestowed it upon you. If you experience a good home, if you're not on the poverty rolls, if you have a nice house to go home to, if you have a warm bed, that is God's common grace to you. Now, you may think, those things I have because I have worked for them. But if you think about it, God could wipe those away in an instant. Just like your health, it's a very fragile thing. If you have a good job, one that puts food on the table, makes it possible for you to live a comfortable life, that's God's grace. If you experience good opportunities living here in this free country, the greatest country on the face of the earth, with all of the privileges that we have, that is God's common grace. You didn't do anything to be born here. 
Some might say it's the luck of the draw. John would say it's a matter of God's grace to you. And all of these things are things that we all experience. Every sinner experiences these things. Christians and non-Christians experience these things. And they are all grace. Why? Because we don't deserve them. This is why I say grace is one of the most important subjects in all of Christianity. If you think for one minute, one instant, that you somehow deserve these things, you have failed to understand your place in the universe and God's place. Just keep your finger there in John for just a minute and turn over two books to Romans. Now, those of you who have been going through the Epistle to the Romans with me, uh, you have taken a look at this first chapter of Romans. In fact, we're still working our way through some of the concepts. But Paul gives us an idea here in Romans chapter 1 as to what we really deserve. Sometimes people will say, all I want from God is what I deserve. Let me tell you something, that is the one thing you do not want from God. (laughs) You do not want what you deserve. And you say, well, what do I deserve? Well, Paul tells us what we deserve. It's right here in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He says, for the wrath of God. Now, there's a very unpopular notion in the 21st century, the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So men are without excuse. Paul is saying God's wrath, that is His judgment, is being poured out against humanity. Because humanity suppresses the truth. It's not a case of being ignorant of the truth. It's not as though we don't know about God. He says God has made himself known in the things that have been made. Theologians refer to this as general revelation. You cannot look at the created order and come away from that thinking this was all something that happened by chance or by accident. To do that, Paul says, is to suppress the truth. But, he goes on to add, verse 21... But although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. What that means is that rather than worshiping the Creator, they began to worship created things. You can worship wealth. You can worship your own health. You can worship your own body. You can worship success. Those are all created things. And that's what we do. We begin to worship created things rather than the Creator. And it's not a case where we don't know that there is a God. The truth is that we just suppress the knowledge of God so that we can avoid or not think about the idea of His wrath. What's that famous line? It's the ultimate, not the penultimate line. We all know what the penultimate line is in Gone with the Wind. The penultimate line is, frankly, my dear. But what's the ultimate line? I'll think about it tomorrow. I'll think about that tomorrow. And that's what we think we can do with the wrath of God. But what Paul is saying is that that is what we deserve. If we got what we deserved, we would get the wrath of God. We would get His judgment. We'd be turned into a cinder. You think about the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul knew this firsthand. Paul had been persecuting the church. He'd been going out and systematically dismantling Christian communities. I say that he's the Heinrich Himmler of his day. He was responsible for the death of the very first Christian martyr, Stephen. 
And on the road to Damascus, Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, at that moment, what did Paul deserve? He deserved the wrath of God. What he received was grace. What he received was mercy, grace in action. So we need to understand, as human beings, what we deserve is the judgment of God. Every single one of us, because we're all born into sin. So everything that good that comes into our life, ultimately, it is a gift. It is a gift from God. Every breath we take is a gift from God. If he were to withheld, withhold his grace for even an instant, you and I would perish. So when theologians talk about the grace of God, this is part of what they mean, the common grace. It's something that we all experience and none of us deserve. But there is another kind of grace, which is even more extraordinary than common grace. And that is saving grace. Common grace is temporary. You only experience common grace while you have breath in your body, while you exist on this earth. Saving grace, which is what we experience in the person of Jesus Christ, which is why John describes him as full of grace and full of truth, saving grace is all the better because it is for eternity. It's not just for this lifetime. It's not just for today. It is forever. Saving grace. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 for just a moment. As most of you know, Ephesians is really my favorite book of the Bible. It's not that I don't love the others as well. It's just that I find all of the great Christian doctrines are distilled here in this one little book. It's action-packed, and I love the way that Paul writes here in this passage. But here's how he describes us, the way we were. Ephesians chapter 2, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. That's the same thing that he's saying in Romans chapter 1. We were doing our own thing, following our own desires, and as a result, in Romans he says we were under God's wrath. We were children of wrath. Here he says we were by nature children of wrath. That's an interesting concept because most of us think that simply by virtue of the fact that we're human beings created by God, we are his children. Nowhere in the Bible, we talked about this when we looked earlier at the verses in John chapter 1, Nowhere does the Bible ever say that we are all children of God. We are all creatures of God, but we are by nature, Paul says, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God. I think there are hardly two more glorious words in the New Testament than those two, but God. But God, being rich in mercy, grace in action, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him, seating us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Paul is all about grace. He's the apostle of grace. Grace, grace, grace. Now, you'll never appreciate the grace of God until you realize what you are by nature. Until you begin to understand what you really deserve from God, as opposed to what you've actually received from God. Now, one of the great examples of this, I'm sure many of you know the story, is John Newton. John Newton wrote what is probably the most famous and perhaps the most popular hymn in the English language, Amazing Grace. 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Well, do you know the story behind John Newton? Some of you do, I think. Now, John Newton was raised in a Christian home as a young boy, but at the age of six, his parents died, both of them. And he was sent to live with an unbelieving relative. And during those formative years of his life, Christianity and the faith were ridiculed by this relative, mocked, made fun of. And so there was instilled within him this sort of apathy toward Christianity. I will say this much, there was a bit of a tug of war because his parents, whom he remembered fondly at the age of six, had taught him the faith. But now he was living with these others and he'd had this other experience and so forth. The story goes that he went off and he joined the Royal Navy, the British Navy. This was in the 18th century. And he said he went off to see the world and, I quote, to sin my fill. That's why he went off. And he did. He was the worst sort of individual. They said that he was the worst swearer in the English Navy. But he got into all sorts of trouble. You can imagine that that kind of attitude will not go far in that kind of life of discipline, where there's nothing so close to God on earth as a captain on the quarterdeck. And the result of all of this is that he realized that he needed to get out of the Royal Navy. So he deserted, which was, incidentally, a punishable offense, punishable by death. But he deserted the Royal Navy, and he fell in with a Portuguese slave trader. And he became involved with this Portuguese slave trader, but he became indebted to the Portuguese slave trader. They were located in Africa at the time, and when the slave trader went off, as he often did, out in search of slaves for the Middle Passage, what happened was that he left his African wife at home. She became the ruling entity in the compound, and she hated all white men. And she punished John Newton mercifully. She kept him alive, but barely. She made him eat his food off the dust ground like a dog. And one day he managed to escape. He flagged down another merchant ship, in this case another slave ship. They took him on board. The captain was disappointed because he thought that perhaps Newton might have some ivory to sell, but that was not the case. But he did discover one thing about Newton. During his time in the Royal Navy, he had learned how to navigate. And so he made him the navigator on this ship. Now, that was a position of trust. But Newton was not a man to be trusted. Not by a long shot. He broke into the captain's store of rum, tore up the ship, and fell overboard. And for a moment or two... The ship's company debated whether or not they ought to just let him drown. But finally, one of the officers on board the ship decided to save him. He grabbed a harpoon, and he threw it into the ocean, and he harpooned John Newton in the thigh. Years later, there was such a gaping wound that still oozed decades after the fact. Newton could still take his fist and put it into the wound in his leg. Well, he was dragged aboard. The ship was making its way towards Scotland, and it got engulfed in a terrible storm. Newton had been such a malcontent and so difficult that the captain sent him down to work the pumps in the bottom of the ship, down there in the bilge, down there with the slaves. And he became infected with the wound became infected. He was filled with fever. He was in misery working the pumps. He was convinced that he was going to perish and that the whole ship was going to sink. And if there were any survivors, being where he was located in the ship, he would never survive. And in desperation, he began to do the one thing that he hadn't done since he had been a mere child. He began to cry out to God. He began to beg for mercy. He began to remember the promises that his parents had instilled within him, even at that tender age, the promises of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. And he cried out for those things. 
and a conversion took place there in that most unlikely of environments. He became a Christian. He felt a, a sense of peace that flooded his soul that even if he were to perish, it would be all right. When he got back to England, he dedicated himself to education. He became a highly educated man. And he became a clergyman in the Church of England. He became a profound influence on successive generations of young men, not the least of whom was a man by the name of William Wilberforce, who would almost single-handedly eradicate the slave trade in the British Empire in the 1830s. He was a man who came to faith through the influence of John Newton, a former slave trader. And as a response to his conversion there, he wrote that extraordinary hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That was his song. Let me ask you this question. Is that your song? Is that your song? Do you see yourself in that way? You think, oh, I'm not as bad as John Newton. Listen, we are all as bad as John Newton. And but for the grace of God, we could all be in that kind of a situation. What would your life be like if you had been raised in a Christian family and at the age of six your parents had died and you were sent off to live with a cruel, unbelieving relative? How might your life be different than it is now? The only reason it isn't, you see, is because of the grace of God, His common grace toward you. And it is the saving grace of Jesus Christ that saved John Newton. It is the saving grace of Jesus Christ that saves us. That was his song. I hope, I pray, it's your song too. Because if you cannot see the glory, the majesty, the beauty of grace, my friends, you really don't understand what Christianity is all about. If you still think that there's something that you deserve from God, then you neither see yourself aright, nor do you see God aright. So he is the one, going back now to John, who is full of grace, full of grace. But he's also full of truth. And this is a very important word as well. Uh, John uses it a number of times, as I think most of you know. John not only wrote this gospel, he wrote four other books in the New Testament as well, three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And this idea of truth is threaded throughout all of those writings. At least 24 times in the writings of John, the truth, the truth, the truth, this is the first time that we encounter it here in John's gospel. You could just take a few look at the few of the passages there to see how he talks about truth. One of the most famous examples, of course, is in John chapter 14, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And I always point out there's a definite article there. He's not a way, a truth, a life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth with a capital T. In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, the Holy Spirit is described as the spirit of truth. So Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, describes himself as the truth. The third person of the Trinity is described as the spirit of truth. And in John chapter 17, the word of God, which comes to the Father from the Father, is described as the word of truth. That's very important because what it tells us is that truth is a vital part of the character of God. He is the God of truth. Christians do not deal in the opinions of men. Everybody's got an opinion. Isn't that true? You, you watch the news, and it doesn't matter what outlet you watch, everybody's got an opinion. And what are they worth? That much, in the ultimate sense. They're not worth a whole lot at all. But you see, we are living in a culture in which people no longer value truth. There was an age in the history of the world when people believed in absolute truth. If, this was, if A was true, then that meant that B was false. 
That's just the way it is. But we're no longer living in that age. We're now living in an age in which truth, like so many other things, is relative. Is it true? Well, that depends. A lot of this started in the 18th century with a man by the name of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Hegel came up with what was known as the dialectic. You know this. He said that there is a thing called a proposition. That is an argument that people set forth. We call that a thesis. And then what happens is that somebody comes along with a counterargument, and we call that the antithesis. And then what happens is that there is this great debate that goes back and forth between the thesis and the antithesis, and what results oftentimes is some sort of a compromise position, which is the synthesis. Ever heard that before? Thesis versus antithesis equals synthesis. Synthesis becomes the new proposition, the new truth. Until what happens? A counterargument comes along, and the whole process goes on and on like that. And so Hegel argued that basically truth was a moving target, an ever-evolving thing. What is true for us may not have been true for those who lived in a previous generation. And what is true for us now won't necessarily be true for those who live 100 years from now. Truth is a constantly evolving thing. But listen, that is not the case. When you ask most people today, is it true, they could care less. What they want to know is, does it work? What do you mean, does it work? Does it work for me? That's one of the reasons why people are encouraged Oprah Winfrey does this all the time. I will never understand why people are so impressed with Oprah Winfrey. I I will never know why people go and seek out wisdom from Oprah Winfrey. But at any rate, one of the things that Oprah Winfrey is constantly telling people who come on her show is that they need to tell their truth. You ever heard that? Tell your truth. Your truth needs to be heard. It's interesting to note she doesn't say the truth. It means that everybody has their own individual version of the truth, and if you're not going to be judgmental, you have to recognize that they're all valid. Now, imagine a system of justice in which people are encouraged to tell just their version of the truth. When you go into a courtroom, you have to swear. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Imagine going into a courtroom where you're on trial. Somebody's accused you of somebody, and they're bringing in a witness, and the witness is against you, and they take an oath that says, do you swear to tell your truth? (laughs) And only your truth. And nothing but your version of the truth. Can you imagine how chaotic, how destructive that would be to society? And that is exactly where we are in Western culture today. There's no other word for it than diabolical. But John says he is the one who is full of grace and he is full of truth. And that is not a subjective moving thing. It is an objective reality. Truth, let me tell you something, as Christian people, truth is something we have to fight for in this culture. It may make us look as though we're judgmental, as though we're uncaring. Actually, it is just the opposite. If you give up truth, you have no hope at all. But in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, we see grace, we see God's grace, and we see God's truth. Now, when we say in Jesus Christ we see truth, what do we mean? We mean two things primarily. We see the truth about mankind, or we are told that we are fallen and we are sinful. may not be what we want to hear, but it is the truth. Reminds me of the little story about a little girl named Mary Ann. Mary Ann, Mary Ann um, got into a fight with her little brother, and her mother was in another room. She came from a uh, 
strict Dutch reform family. And she heard this fighting. The mother came flying into the room and she saw Mary Ann. She had her brother by the hair and she was kicking him in the shins. And her mother pulled him apart, sent the little brother up to his room and sat Mary Ann, who was the older of the two, down in the corner and said, Mary Ann, why did you do that? Mary Ann, why did you allow the devil to put into your heart to pull your brother's hair and kick him in the shins? Mary Ann thought for a moment. She said, well, it's not exactly true. Mother said, what do you mean? She said, well, the devil may have put into my mind to pull his hair, but kicking his shins was my own idea. (laughs) That's good theology, folks. That's good theology. But we are sinful. So in Jesus Christ, we learn the truth about ourselves. We also learn the truth about God, that he is just, but he's also loving, and he is merciful, And he satisfies his love and his justice there on the cross where the two kiss each other in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Peter wrote, For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. Do you realize Christ suffered for you? Do you realize that is the truth? It's not just suffering for the mass of humanity in a generic sort of way. He suffered for you. Why? Because you are just as bad as Mary Ann. We always want to shift the blame to somebody else, but the reality is most of the time when we do wicked, evil things, contrary to God's word, we do them because that's what we are. I'm sure you know the story of Horatio Spafford. I'll close with this. Horatio Spafford was a businessman in Chicago in the 19th century. Uh, He made a great fortune, but lost a lot of that in the great Chicago fire. And uh, they were devastated financially, he and his family, but they were devout Christians. He was a very devoted Presbyterian, an elder in his church. And he decided that the best thing that he could do was to sort of uproot his family. They had been too tied to material things anyway, And they were going to move to England and start a new life. And so he put his wife on board a ship with their three daughters, little daughters, and sent them on a ship across the Atlantic Ocean to England. And in a freak accident, the ship they were on collided. Very freak. Can you imagine on the Atlantic Ocean, as big as it is, it collided with another ship. And hundreds perished. Some were saved, but the vast majority on board were lost. Now, Horatio Spafford had not gone on board. He had to finish up some business matters before he could join them. And so he received a cable that came, a telegraph came to him, and it was from his wife. And she said she alone had been saved. All of their children had perished. Can you imagine? Well, Spafford got on a ship, first one he could get, to England to join his wife. But everybody, it was in all the newspapers, this tragedy. He was below deck for the entire voyage, but he asked the captain of the ship, when they reached the point where his wife's ship had gone down, he said, I I would very much like to come up on deck. And so they notified him, and he came up on deck It was a terrible day. It was gray, it was cold, it was a spitting rain. And he looked out over that tempestuous sea, knowing that's where his little girls had all been lost, perished, all of them. And he wrote these marvelous words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well It is well with my soul. Now, here's the question. It's a wonderful hymn, but that's not my point. The question is this, how can you say that? How can you, in the midst of tragedy or disaster, say, it is well with my soul? He could say it because Horatio Spafford knew what he was, a sinner who had been saved by grace. He didn't deserve anything from the Lord. 
Any good in his life was a gift from the Lord. He'd experienced common grace just to have those children for as long as he did. They had been entrusted to his care. But he could say, it is well with my soul because he knew that they had been entrusted to a gracious God. A gracious God who redeems everything that is precious and is lost. To me, the most powerful stanza in that entire hymn is not the first one, which everybody knows, but the third one. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. If that is true for you, it will be well with you and with your soul no matter what. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise that you are a God of grace and a God of truth and that we see both of these in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us the ability to see ourselves aright, to revel in your grace and in your mercy and to give our lives for the proclamation of your truth. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, right. Isn't that the truth?